So we've had solar for a year now. Has it been worth it? Let's find out. Hey guys, welcome back to Saving Green. My name is Josh. Here at the channel, I look at the science and crunch the numbers to help you make informed decisions and help your wallet and the planet at the same time. And getting solar panels on your roof is one of those topics that really almost helped me start the channel to begin with. I had so many questions from family and friends about what our experience was like, whether it was gonna be worth it. And I made a few videos on getting started with solar. If you wanna explore those, I will link to that playlist up here. But today we're gonna to look back on the first year of production and see how it compared to the estimates from our installer. So for today, I wanna to divide the conversation into a few different sections. Number one, what our energy use was before we got solar and how much we were spending every month. And secondly, how we priced our system and sized our solar system. Number three, what our performance has been over this past year. And number four, any summary or take home conclusions that can help you decide if solar is right for you. So what I did is I made a spreadsheet that will help summarize some of the information for me. It's a little bit disjointed. It may not make total sense to you guys, but I'll walk you through it and then highlight the important bullet points. So the first thing to look at is how much money we were spending on our electricity prior to solar. And it was quite a bit. We have a 3,000 square foot house in South Florida, and even despite our smart Nest thermostats keeping our home between 75 and 78 degrees, we were still spending a lot on our electricity. In fact, in 2019, we spent $4,634.41 through FPNL. That bought us about 38,000 kilowatt hours of electricity total, or just over 3,100 kilowatt hours every month. And that's a boatload of money. Most of that, over 50%, is due to our cooling costs because we had two three-ton very old air conditioning units. One of them was almost 18 years old when we bought our home. So because of that and because of our expenses, we realized we had to do something. So we decided to get solar. So how do we price that out? Well, we shopped around and got a few different estimates from different companies, ranging from 11 kilowatts to 25 kilowatts. And we ended up with a 16 kilowatt system that was supposed to generate about 24,100 kilowatt hours every year of AC power. And the 16 kilowatt is measured in DC. And if you need more information about how we went through that conclusion, again, I will link back to the playlist and a video on generally how to size a solar panel system array. So our 16 kilowatt system, was gonna offset about 75% of our electricity use with the other 25% from getting a new air conditioning unit system and a new water heater. Now we were able to bundle those with the cost of our system. So even though we were spending about $4.25 per watt, if we take out the included cost of the air conditioning units, it's really about three and a half cents per watt, which is expensive, but right in line with estimates in our local area. Now Tesla Solar does offer cheaper panels at about $2 per watt, but there are some different pricing schemes and advantages to going with Tesla. For example, now they're bundling their power wall included if you wanted to go off grid. We wanted to stay on grid, so for that, that's the reason why we went with this system. So how much did it cost? So our system costs in total about $68,100 with a 2.99% APR interest rate. Now that was a 21 year term, 21 and a half year term with the first 18 months interest only. That means that we're spending about $23,000 in interest if we pay our payment as planned. The first year was about $160 interest only and that bumps up to about $341 once we start paying our principal after that. Now, according to that, that would be about $91,000 total over the lifetime of the loan, which means we'd be almost breaking even over the course of the time. In other words, we wouldn't be saving that much money. However, that's not factoring in the federal tax rebate, which in our case was, a, was about 30%. Today, it's about 26%. So always look at solar incentives to think about pricing out your system. We also decided to put some money down. We put 10% down, knowing we were gonna get uh, money back from the federal government. And we decided to put all of it, once we got it, back into the loan. That brings our total principal down to about $47,000. And that means that our interest on the new principal would be about $15,000. Now, according to my calculations, if we paid off our loan with the same principal payment, with the same estimated monthly payment, about $341, we paid off in about 15 and a half years. During that time, we would save about $10,000 versus our current utility bills. 
Now that's based on a 2.5% year-over-year increase on utility bill pricing, which could be conservative based on fp estimates of maybe 5 or 10% based on capital improvements on their end. But nonetheless, we're still saving money based on our current projections. In fact, over 20 years, we are anticipating to save about $31,000 based on my calculations, or about a third of the cost of what we would be spending otherwise with our utility bills. Now, we did not have to reinvest the money back from our solar into the project. We could have used it in other means or other investment vehicles, like putting it in the market or real estate. We decided though to basically put it back in because it's funny we weren't getting back anyway, and we wanted the peace of mind of paying it off a little bit faster. So you can run the numbers and look at your amortization schedules and interest calculators. I will put those online for reference so you can kind of price your system out appropriately. So overall, how do we do in the first year? As compared to our 4,600 utility bill cost last year, it dropped down to $651, or about 86% savings on our energy bill. That actually cut our energy use that we were paying from FP&L through net metering down to 4,669 kilowatt hours, which is great. That's an 88% drop off. It's not 100%, but it's 88, which is good. And there's a reason for that discrepancy. Now, of course, we have to add in not only the cost of our electricity through FP&L that we're still paying for, but also a few extra costs. One is a sunk cost of about $10 a month for net metering. That's the charge that we pay every month for the service of calibrating how much money we're sending and receiving to the grid. And secondly, an insurance policy of about $10.65 a month for surge protection. So God forbid if our house gets struck by lightning and our system blows up, we are covered for that. We thought it was worth the $10 a month for that as well. So that's an extra $20 a month that we weren't paying previously. And with that factored in, that still is included in the $651 that we're sending to FP&L. Now, while our first year was interest only, we did pay a little bit more, $100 every month. So we set our first year's payment about $250 a month for $3,000 a year. If we add that to our FP&L payments, that's a 21% savings overall in the first year. Not too shabby. However, if we bring this forward to the following year, when our principal is gonna be paid off, if we jump to 341, plus if we keep our uh, utility rates similar, that would mean a 2% increase overall in our cost compared to if we had stayed with our utility bill. But why is that? Well, part of that's because if we look at our end phase generation, which is what we are seeing in terms of, of our panel performance online, every inverter can report back its production. We're seeing that we only generated 21,400 kilowatt hours over this last year, which is less than the 24,100 that is anticipated. So that 12% drop off can be attributed to a few different things. One, a couple of our panels were underproducing. We had to get those inverters replaced. That was covered by the warranty. And two, we live in a golf course. And as you can see from these pictures, we have a lot of golf ball damage, particularly on our east facing array, which is devastating. Unfortunately, this is not covered by insurance. Even though these panels are hurricane and hail resistant, they are not titleist resistant, and therefore we have to pay for that. It's not as expensive as it was up front, but it is an additional cost that we are still pricing out. However, that most likely is accounting for the individual panel inefficiencies and for that 12% drop off. Assuming we get that fixed and our panels go up, we should see that return to our predicted value of 24,100 kilowatt hours for the coming year. We're also installing some bamboo for both aesthetics and to create a barrier. I'll show you some pictures of that. So yep, that's additional cost, but nonetheless, not everything in life can be expected. I'm just showing you what it is like for us today. So if we look at the FP&L purchasing versus what Enphase or inverters are reporting, there's also quite a bit of a disparity. In fact, while we're producing 21,400 kilowatt hours over this past year, Enphase is only assuming we're still drawing 13,000 kilowatt hours from the grid, which is a lot more than what FP&L is actually charging us. That means that from our end phase, we're using 35,009 kilowatt hours, which is only a 7.7% savings of 2019's numbers. That doesn't seem accurate at all. I think that because of our efficiency improvements from our air conditioning units, we should be looking at a lot less. So therefore, if I look at what I'm paying for through FP&L for the 4,669 kilowatt hours, and I add that to the 21,400 kilowatt hours from solar generation, now we're looking at a 26,000 uh, and 69 kilowatt hour total energy usage, which is a 31% energy reduction, which is, I think, a lot more in line with our estimates. 
So now let's look at our summaries. So basically, in 2019, we were consuming 37,943 kilowatt hours, and in 2020, that dropped down to 4,669 from the grid. If we add our solar production, that's 26 versus 37, or 31% savings. The carbon footprint has been reduced by 76%. That's based on a 426 gram per kilowatt hour estimate from the EPA from our local utility rates, which means that for every kilowatt hour we're paying for from FPNL, if we add that to the 60 grams per kilowatt hour of our solar uh, panel production, that means that we went from 16,163 kilograms of CO2 down to 3,865 or 76% reduction in terms of gallons of gasoline, 1,800 to 439. So again, a huge amount of energy savings there. And these 60 grams of CO2 is based on some estimates from online resources based on life cycle analysis for solar. So what are the important take homes here? Well, in the first year, based on our payments, including our down payment and our reinvestment from the tax credits, we saved about $980 from our utility payments last year alone. Now, while that is more expensive than what the efficiencies would have saved us, about 30%, it's still a great amount of savings, and our carbon footprint has dropped by about 76% from my estimates. Now, according to our payment schedule, we should pay off our solar panels in about 15 years, at which point we'll save about $10,000 versus what our electric bill would have been. Over 20 years time, that would grow to about $31,000 or over 30% of what our payments would have been based on a 2.5% year over year annual increase in our utility rates. Of course, that's highly variable and not totally predictable, but nonetheless, I think it's probably more or less in line. Unfortunately though, our Enphase inverters and our FPNL utility bill are not always in sync. In fact, it seems like our Enphase is assuming we're drawing more from the grid than we actually are. I think what we're actually paying FPNL is the more important metric, and therefore we can assume that we have saved about 30% of our energy simply by upgrading our air conditioning units, which is huge. So that definitely did pay off, at least from my calculations. I also think that we have to take a step back and think about this solar project on the whole. $68,000 is a huge investment, but this is not money that we're just simply spending because we want to spend it. We're spending it because we would be spending this money on our utility bills anyway. So we have to think about the opportunity cost and the cost benefit analysis, including the environmental benefit and the cost benefit as well. I think that solar in the right circumstances, in ours in particular, has saved us money and it will continue to save us money in the long run. And cutting our carbon footprint by 75% is certainly a huge benefit. And perhaps the most important reason to consider this. Ultimately, you're gonna have to make that decision for yourself. But in our first year, I think it's been paid off. And even with the hiccups and the inefficiencies of having to replace uh, some damage panels, I still think it's one of those things that we just have to roll with and I don't regret doing it. And I'll let you know next year, once we once these panels have been replaced and once the bamboo has grown to its full height to see if our energy production has increased respectively. So thanks again for your time. If you found it helpful, considering liking or subscribing to Saving Green, and I will see you in the next video.